All right, so, so it's Father's Day, so I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a couple of dad jokes, right? Yes, all right, here we go. Why stand in a corner if you're cold? Because it's 90 degrees. I, I, I should have said already, Jonathan, you're not allowed to answer these because he knows every single dad joke, okay? Um, I had a dream last night, uh, you know, uh, that I was a muffler. It's really weird. I woke up exhausted. <laughs> and last but not least, do you know why you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at hiding. Okay. All right. I know. I know. I saved the best for last. I know. All right. Before we get started, I, I do have to get serious here for a second. In two weeks from today, we're going to have a really quick members meeting right after service. We're going to vote in a, a, a new set or, or more deacons. So if you are a member in good standing, which means if you've been an active member in the last year, uh, then you're welcome to come to that. It'll take all of about five minutes right after service. So that'll be in two weeks from today. So, all right, here we go. My title for today, I figured we would talk about a really cool guy, Nehemiah. So it's simple, Nehemiah. We're in our simple series. Simple does not mean um, not much to it, not much content. Simple means, and, and as we're looking at this, being a simple follower of Jesus is just, we're, 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 we're cutting out all the confusing stuff. We're, we're making it pure and true. And looking at, every week we're looking at three specific things that simple followers of Jesus do or know. And so uh, I'm trying to keep these messages just really, really cookies on the bottom shelf. I'm not a complicated guy, so I need to have things kind of really easy to understand. So this has been working really well for me. So Nehemiah, we, we need to know a few things about Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and the reason why I chose him for Father's Day is Nehemiah is a man's man. I mean, Nehemiah, he was a, a builder. He, he built the, or rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem in, in, in a very, very short amount of time. We'll see that today. Um, he was a leader. We'll see him as he just goes in and he, he, he makes these challenges and gives these speeches and people just rally behind him. Um, he had status. He worked for the king, okay, and basically the king of the world. Um, he was not intimidated, I mean, this dude was, was just straight up not intimidated whatsoever. He had enemies come against him. He wasn't worried about it a bit. Uh, and then, but last but not least, his relationship with the Lord was infectious. And we're going to see that as well today. So who was this guy, Nehemiah? Well, Nehemiah was a Jew. He was born into the Babylonian or really more the Persian captivity when, when uh, Israel was exiled to Babylon that happened for a, a while and he was born in that captivity. So um, he was born around 473 BC. So almost 500 years before Christ, we have Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah had never seen Jerusalem, never been to Jerusalem until he went back to rebuild the wall. Um, he was a cupbearer to the king, which means he was the guy that all of the king's food and drink, he would test it to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Now, that's kind of a crazy job to have, right? Um, but it actually, it, it seems like these guys were a dime a dozen and, oh, he killed over dead. That food's not good. We'll just get a new guy. That's not really the case. He was very, very esteemed. Um, he was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Any, anybody ever heard of King Artaxerxes? And you probably heard of King Xerxes. King, King Xerxes was right before, uh, from like from the movie 300. Not exactly the biblical account of how that all went down, but, um, but King Artaxerxes, he was the stepson to a very famous person in the Bible that we know. Who is that? Queen Esther. Yes, so the king that Nehemiah served was the stepson of Queen Esther. So we, we often think about the Bible as just like all of these chopped up stories, but when you really look at it like this, we see how it really fits in and works well with each other because it is one continuous story, God's story. Um, and then also, 
Nehemiah was required to be smart. There were, there were very specific qualifications to be a cupbearer. So he would have been smart. He would have been cultured. He would have been knowledgeable in politics. He would have been a good conversationalist, meaning if the king wanted to spark up a conversation with his cupbearer, who he would have been around the king a lot, he would have to have something to say. He would have to know what to talk about. Um, also, uh, funny thing, he was required to be handsome. That was a requirement to be in the king's court. Apparently, no ugly people were allowed in the king's court because like, everybody had to be pretty and beautiful in the king's court. So that's true. So everybody's turned to Nehemiah, hopefully, by now. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. Otherwise, everything's going to be up on the screen. And we're going to get through, I, I know, I know, you're, you're going to say there's no possible way you're going to get through that much, but we're actually going to blow through six chapters today, which is probably going to be a new record for me, because uh, I can build a sermon series on one verse. Uh, but anyway, we are going to blow through this quickly. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is working for the king. They're in Susa, which was one of the three places that the king traveled throughout the year, catching the right seasons, catching the weather uh, at his different palaces. So uh, one of the guys uh, came, and he had just come from Israel and Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is like, hey, Tell me what's going on there, because within every Jew's heart is this longing for Jerusalem and this longing for Israel. Verse 3, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, yeah, that's bad. To us, but to them, this would have been absolutely horrendous. Verse 4, and we see it here. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So we'll skip a few verses. He, he prays. Immediately he goes to prayer. So he prays. He asks God to listen to him, which is kind of bold when you pray, but that ought to be an assumption that God's going to listen to you when you pray, but he, he, he's, he's very direct. That whole kindness is clarity, or, or clarity is kindness thing, Nehemiah is like, God, I need you to listen to me right now. He didn't do it in a disrespectful way, but he was very clear. So he asked God to listen to him. He confesses the sin of the Israelites and his sin, which is always important when you're going into prayer. He reminds God of God's covenant to Israel. Now, do you think God forgot about his covenant to Israel? Probably not. But again, he's praying bold prayers. He's reminding him, he's reiterating the promise that God would deliver them. And then he finishes with verse 11, and here it is. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, meaning the king. And then he states his position, I was cupbearer to the king. That leads us to our first point. Simple followers of Jesus use prayer as the first line of defense. It says, when he heard this, he mourned, he wept, he prayed. Immediately he went to God and said, God, this is catastrophic. God, this, this cannot be. To not have a wall around your city back then was an absolute disgrace. It was basically like, God, I don't care what you have given me. I don't care about my city. I have no pride in what you have given to us. It, it can just come and be taken over uh, by rebel armies or by a, a, another nation. So to have a wall was this security around them. So he was distraught. So simple followers of Jesus use prayer 
as the first line of defense. James 5.16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I love that. The, the effective, fervent prayer. You're, you're just going to God, just pouring out your heart. It says, when you do that, it avails much. Now, I hate to say this. And guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you a few times today. But oftentimes, women get the award in our families for being the prayer warriors. And ladies, please don't stop, okay? Don't stop doing that. But guys, we ought to be the prayer champions in our homes. I, I, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am standing here speaking to you right now in this moment because several years ago, Nikki was praying for me, praying for me, and then she got the book, The Power of a Praying Wife, and started praying even more and more and more, and I am standing here right now because of her prayer. Okay, so, so ladies, please don't stop. And by the way, commercial, starting on June 25th, the ladies have a new uh, summer study that they're having on Tuesday nights. By the way, it's called When You Pray. So that's kind of fitting, isn't it? Um, but guys, as the leaders of our homes, we need to be praying for over and with our families. It should be the first line of defense. Not after we've complained about our situation, not after we've told a bunch of people, not after we've sat and sulked about it. And, and, and maybe, yes, you've got to work through some things, maybe, but prayer ought to be the first line of defense. There was a true story, and this isn't really a joke, so don't be looking for anything funny at the end, but there was two pastor's wives, and this was kind of back in the day, and they worked at this church, and both of these pastor's wives, at the same time, they were together, and they were mending their husband's pants. They kind of used to do that back then. Now we just buy new pants, right? They were, they were mending their pants, and one of them said to the other, oh, you know, poor John, he's been so discouraged lately about all the things going on in their church, and there was some, some kind of turmoil in the church happening. She's like, poor John, you know, he's, he comes home every day so frustrated, and he just, he doesn't know what to do. He's really, honestly, he's kind of thinking about throwing in the towel, and it seems like nothing ever goes right for him. He's just, he's just frustrated all the time, and, and the other wife she said, wow, that's, that's too bad. My husband is, keeps telling me he's never felt closer to the Lord. Like, like he's never been more fulfilled. And that husband was going through the same thing that, that John was going through. And, and it's just like, it, it just seems like he just continues to seek after the Lord. And, and he's just, he's finding fulfillment. And, and he actually even has joy through all this. And then this really, this huge silence fell in the room. And the women went back to mending the pants. And wouldn't you know, the first woman was mending the seat of her husband's pants. The other woman was mending the knees of her husband's pants. See, when we go to the Lord, we can be in the very same situation. But when we go to God in prayer, it just brings us in closer relationship. And it doesn't matter what we are going through. We can still find that peace in the midst of turmoil because we are seeking the Lord. Billy Graham, who ran all of these crusades and just you know, spoke to millions upon millions of people and, and led countless people to the Lord, uh, he said this. He said, three things are necessary for a successful crusade. The first is prayer. The second is prayer. And the third is prayer, for sure. Simple followers of Jesus use prayer as the first line of defense. Chapter 2, it starts out super exciting, right? In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Now remember, the very last verse, and again, there was no chapter numbers and verse numbers back then. It all kind of flowed through. It was all one letter or book as we call them. It said, I was cupbearer to the king. And then it goes right here. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Basically means nothing to us. But let me read it to you in the Living Bible. It says, 
one day in April, four months later. He dropped to his knees, he prayed fervently, he fasted, he prayed fervently, he fasted some more, he wept some more, he prayed fervently four months. God didn't just swoop right in and fix his problem. Now, you may say four months, man, that's a long time. You may say, well, technically for God to do what he was going to do, waiting only four months is really not that big of a deal. And in the grand scheme of things, it's really not. I, I know a lady, I've told you this before, that she, she became a follower of Jesus and she prayed fervently for her husband for 25 years to come to know Jesus. And sure enough, that prayer, 25 years later, it paid off. Prayer is powerful, but God, guess what? He answers prayer in his time. So, back to verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Now, that's not good. You, you, you don't be sad in front of the king. It, it could be the end for you. So it says, I was very much afraid. Yeah, I bet you were. But listen to his confidence in this. But I said to the king, may the king live forever, which was a, a very common greeting to start out with. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So not only is he risking being sad in the king's presence, but he's, he's just going for it. Like that, That's one of the reasons why I love Nehemiah. He's just like, you know what? I'm just going to put it out there. I prayed for an opportunity, and God, I'm hoping this is it. Otherwise, I don't really have to worry about a wall around Jerusalem anymore, if you catch my drift. Verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, let me ask you a question. What kind of prayer do you think he prayed right then? Do you think he went all King James and he's like, Our oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He got down on his knees and he prays this big flowery prayer. You think that's what he did right in front of the king? Probably not, right? He probably did what I call a popcorn prayer. Hey, God, I need you right now in this moment. Please give me the words. Now, that shouldn't be the norm. That shouldn't be the deepest prayer that we pray. But do you know that those prayers work too? When God knows that you're bringing him into a situation, and let's just face it, sometimes things pop up at work or in your relationship or God, please let me respond to what was just said in the right way. And you got it, boom, that is so powerful. God wants to be brought into your conversations in that, and God can and will use that. Verse 5, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? Interesting question. I bet Nehemiah's going, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm still going to continue to go for it. But I would have been pretty freaked out at this point, right? But there's a proverb. There's a proverb that I love. It's Proverbs 21.1. And I'll read it in the New King James. It says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. What a cool verse, isn't it? Okay, anybody know any kings? Yeah, me neither. Okay, so does this verse not apply? Or could this be your boss's heart is in the hand of the Lord? Or your spouse's heart is is in the hand of the Lord. Or, you know, that jerk that cut you off in traffic, his heart is in the hand, like I like his heart in my hands right now. 
okay? But see, God controls hearts. God is in control. Number two, simple followers of Jesus live. There is one key word in this phrase, and it's the word live. Not think like God is in control. Not believe that God is in control. Not, oh, they heard it in a sermon one time that God is in control. Simple followers of Jesus live like God is in control. When you live like God is actually in control, it's a game changer. And, 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 and I want to tell you guys a secret, okay? Don't tell anybody. You can't let it out of these doors, okay? These four walls. God is in control, okay? I, I know, because uh, again, we don't usually live like that all the time. But he really is. And when we live and we make decisions like he is in control, it's a complete game changer. So I guess the question is, why do we live like he is not in control? Ouch, huh? We claim that he's able. We we claim that he's able to do anything. You guys remember that old hymn, He is Able? You guys, who, who remembers that song? Sing it with me. Hey, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he is able. Okay. Um, we claim it, right? We claim, God, you are able. You're in control. You do everything. But we live like it's questionable that he is able. That's, that's how we live. Now, we probably don't believe that way, but we, we, we live like it's questionable. We pray like it's optional. And here's the worst one. We worry like he's not capable. I'll give you those three again because those are some zingers. We live like it's questionable that he's able. We pray like it's optional. And we worry like he's not capable. God is in control. I love Ephesians 3.20. It says, now to him, that's God, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. I love that. It, like, like, you know what immeasurably means? It means you can't measure it, okay? To, to the God who, who can do so much more than you can ask or, here's another one of those cool words, imagine. Paul is saying, listen, the God that I follow He's able to do more than you can even imagine. Like you can't even fathom the goodness that he can do. That's how good he is. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. That power that allows him to do immeasurably more is actually what is the very same thing that's working inside of us. That's an awesome God. So I thought of this that I was stuck in. Here's a question. What if God is looking down on us? And I don't know exactly. I don't know if he's actually looking down. He, he looks everywhere. Okay, but just, just bear with me, okay? What if God is looking down on us waiting on us to actually believe that he's going to make good on his promises. What if that thing that you've been praying for and asking for and waiting for this whole time, what if the very last part of the equation is just God, he's just sitting there waiting for you to actually believe it? I hate to say it, but I bet that happens a lot. Because even though we prayed, even though we asked for it, I don't know that we have always have the faith to believe that he can and will do it. Verse 6, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. So a simple popcorn prayer, along with the previous four months of prayer and fasting and all of that, convinced God to work in this king's heart. So 
Nehemiah, he asked for, catch this, talking about bold. Again, this is why I love Nehemiah. He asked for not only a leave of absence. By the way, he, he was basically a slave. You know that, right? Like he was born into captivity. He was a slave. Now he was well-treated. He would have been more considered a servant, but he was a slave. So he asked for a leave of absence, a letter of safe passage, because it would have been a dangerous trip back if not, if not for that. And catch this, he asked for the king to partially finance this project. That's bold, yo. I mean, that is like what Nehemiah is just going for it. He is swinging for the fences. Respectful, but bold. If you get one thing from today, this is what I want you to get. And here it is. Time on your knees before the king of heaven gives you confidence on your feet before the kings of earth. When you spend time on your knees before the king of heaven, God, if it be your will, God, this is the thing that that I need. God, this is what's troubling me. God, whatever, not my will, but yours be done. But God, I need you now. Time on your knees before the king of heaven gives you confidence on your feet before the kings of the earth. And remember, who do we say could be a king? Anybody. So everything is going so well to this point, right? And then chapter 2, verse 10. It says, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So here we have these these other characters, the bad guys enter into the story. Here's where it gets super interesting. So he goes to Jerusalem. He gets there. He gives this awesome, encouraging speech. and, and, And the people of Jerusalem are like, yes, let's do this. Let's rebuild the wall. And they start the work. Now down to verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this that you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now, they didn't even know he works for the king. And they're saying, you you, you must be rebelling against the king. You don't know what you're doing. They have no clue what they're talking about. But notice, did he say anything about the king? He didn't say one word about the fact that he was sent there from the king. What did he say? The God of heaven will give us success. He doesn't worry about earthly kings. He worries about the king of kings and says, that God is going to give us success. Moving in God's direction, here's just a freebie, often results in the enemy's opposition. When you do something that the Lord loves... The enemy is going to hate it. You are going to run into opposition. You should probably just count on that most of the time. Don't mean to be a Debbie Downer. Don't mean to, you know, I'm not a pessimist by any means, but that's probably going to be ready. We need to have the faith to withstand that. So chapter three, we won't read any of it. He names all of the builders, but he does something really cool. He says, next to them were these guys. Next to them was this guy. Next to him was this guy. And he creates this sense of community of the people of of Jerusalem building this wall. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, things are getting much worse now. He said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. So what does Nehemiah do when he's faced with a growing threat? 
Well, he does what he always does. Verse 4. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Now, prayer is powerful. Prayer is effective. Prayer works. Be very cautious when you pray. This is one of those prayers in Scripture that is a straight-up savage prayer. Listen to what he says here. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Okay, we're in church, so I have to be cautious as to how I say this, but do you know what he basically just prayed to God? Um, Don't forgive their sins and let happen to them what happens to people that you don't forgive their sins. He was telling them to go somewhere. Is exactly what he was doing. Is God bring everything down on their heads because they are trying to stop your work, your plan. And we cannot have that. Your plan is number one. Verse six. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. I love this verse. In other translations, it says, the people had a mind to work. That was actually the title of our capital campaign that we had here several years ago to pay off debt here. The people had a mind to work or the people worked with all their heart. Verse seven, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So what did he do? Verse 9, but we prayed to our God and things are changing, things are getting a little more serious. So number one, he prayed and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. I mean, they got their swords. It, It says in one place, it says they were working with one hand and had their sword in the other. That's, that's awesome. So chapter five, Chapter 5 is interesting. It kind of takes a break from the wall and tells us about some internal issues that they were having. I love this chapter. I could preach a whole message on this chapter. Um, Nehemiah has to step in and straighten out some things, and, and it actually happens fairly easily and fairly quickly because of the moral authority that Nehemiah had. I, I love, love, love that passage. Uh, now, chapter 6. Here we go. Let's close this out. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message, come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono, but they were scheming to harm me. So the enemies knew, uh, It's going to happen, so we can't stop this from happening. So let's try to be his friend now. Friend, right, with the air quotes. And, hey, let's, let's, let's go see if we can get him distracted and away from them. Hey, 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 Nehemiah, come, come, come down to the plains of Ono. He says, but they were scheming to harm me. He's like, oh, no, I'm not going to Ono. See what he did there? Okay. Verse 3, this is one of the, I thought of another one earlier, so that one would be the better response, but this is one of the best responses to anything in all of Scripture. And we're going to read it in the New King James because I like how it says it. So you've got to picture this. Nehemiah is, is presently working on the wall. He says, so I sent messengers to them. He didn't go. He's like, nope, you you go tell these guys I'm busy. I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. Now, I need you to picture this. And it, it doesn't say this, and I'm not trying to add to Scripture, but 
when I read this story, and I have read over this so many times and taught on this so many times, I picture Nehemiah either up on the wall, but really I picture him on a ladder, like, like carrying stones up the ladder. Like, I, I, I don't know, but I picture him presently working. And, and yes, when it says, uh, you know, down to the plains of Ono, Jerusalem is up here. The plains of Ono would have, would have geographically been down. So that is what they are talking about. But here's how I like to see this. Here's, here's how this affects me in the greatest way. I picture Nehemiah on a ladder in the middle of working, and he says, he looks down. They're like, hey, hey, come down. We want to be friends now. They want to talk to you. Come down to the plains of Ono. And I picture him looking down, hanging onto the ladder, maybe got a rock, maybe he's got some kind of tools or something. He says, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Like he's in the middle of what he's doing. I'm not even going to come down from the ladder to answer you. I'll just answer you right here because what I am doing is so important. See, that's the resolve that we need to have, church. Number three, simple followers of Jesus keep first things first. What God has put there for you to do, that is the thing you need to concentrate on. Do not get distracted. And, and guess what? They're not always bad distractions. They're, they're probably some good things. I, I heard it recently said, the difference between a good leader and a great leader is a great leader says no most of the time. Because they know exactly what they've been called to do and you are not going to distract them from what they've been called to do. Simple followers of Jesus keep first things first. Now, I'm, again, here's one of those times I'm going to act like I'm just speaking to the men, but this is basically for everybody here, okay? God has a very specific plan and purpose for your life. Guys, ladies too, but guys, I'm just talking to you right now. You know that, right? A very, very specific job. And God has assigned very specific roles to men very specific roles to women, very specific roles to mothers, very specific roles to fathers. Now, I do want to pause for just one second and say, those of you who are single moms and single dads, I applaud you for playing both roles. I, I pray blessing and favor and grace and mercy and patience and resources and, and all of that. I, I pray that on you because I cannot imagine what that would take. But God has assigned us very, very specific roles and responsibilities. And any time that we get distracted from those, bad things happen. God is counting on you, men, fathers, to fulfill that role. And if you're allowing distractions to get in the way, great, small distractions, the things that God specifically chose for you to do are either going to fall by the wayside or maybe just get a half-hearted attempt. And that's not what God has called us to, especially as men. Your family deserves better. Your job deserves better. Your wife deserves better. And last but not least, your God deserves better than for us to get distracted from what he has called us to do. Simple followers of Jesus keep first things first. Two more verses and we're done. So the wall was completed. This is verse 15. The wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Nehemiah went, challenged the city. They came together. They rebuilt an entire wall around a city in 52 days. That's impossible except, except for God. Verse 16, 
When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. I love that. I love that it says that. Your enemies, by the way, including the enemy, will tremble when they see the God of all creation working in and through you. You want to make your enemies tremble? You want them to be afraid of you? Let them see God working in you no matter what, just nothing else. I am focused on what God has called me to do. That's it. Nothing else is going to distract me. Your enemies will tremble. So three characteristics of simple followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus use prayer as the first line of defense. Number two, simple followers of Jesus live like God is in control. And number three, simple followers of Jesus keep first things first. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are in control. God, I know so many times, especially as men, we feel the need to jump in and fix things. We feel the need to stick our nose in, in areas where we shouldn't. We feel the need to take over control from you, but God, help us not to do that. Help us not to be so foolish. God, help us to wear the holes in our knees because we are constantly going to you in prayer. God, help us to see prayer as a foundation in our lives, as protection for encouragement, for requests, for, for praise. God, help us to have a better relationship with you through prayer and through trust. Thank you, God, that you are so clear in your word that we can trust you, that you are in control. God, help us to live like you are in control. And God, if there are some here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who don't have an actual relationship with you, maybe they've counted on their good works or just somebody else's faith or church attendance or whatever it is, God, right now in this moment, would you speak to their hearts? Help them to see their need for you. Help them to know that you are real and that you desire relationship with them. One in almost 8 billion people on this earth and you desire relationship with each and every one of us. So God, in this moment, those who do not know you as their personal savior, would they just say, God, I want you. God, I need you. I trust that Jesus died for me, hung on a cross, rose again three days later. I put my full faith and trust in you, Jesus. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you said that this morning for the first time, that you desire starting a relationship with Jesus, would you just put your hand up? I'm not gonna call on you or anything. I just wanna know to be praying for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today's the day. I got it right. I started a relationship with Jesus today. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. Thank you, Lord, that you are real. And you are so present in our lives. God, help us to trust. Help us to stay focused on the job that you have given us, especially, God, as dads, as husbands, as the leaders in our home. God, help us to do what you have called us to do. God, give us patience, give us guidance, and help us to trust you in all things. 
And Lord, we lift up this time of offering. God, may we be generous as a church to reach out into this community and to reach out into this world and further your kingdom however we can. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. And it is in the awesome, most holy name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.